uh, see you. Uh, I imagine that most of you know what Edo period is, but maybe because I see a couple of very young student uh, looking people, uh, I have to very briefly tell you Edo period is uh, from uh, 1603 to 1868. It's slightly over 250 years, but this is the said to be the most interesting an exciting uh, period uh, of Japan for the, the culture and uh, artworks. Uh, this was the era under the rule of uh, Tokugawa shogunate, and uh, this is the most uh, stable time that uh, people didn't fight with each other, so the culture uh, and art flourished. Um, as I saw this book, uh, Taiwan is introducing you so many art forms like uh, sculpture, paintings, prints, scrolls, screens, uh, lacquerware, you know. Um, as I said, you, you're going to learn so much from this book, but you also are going to learn so much from this talk today. So, um, over to you. Thank you, Shioko, very much for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming on what turned out to be a beautiful evening. I thought everyone was going to be standing outside pubs rather than <laughs> attending this. And, of course, I thank uh, very heartily the Daiwa Foundation for hosting the event, for Reaction Books, for publishing it. It does look really good. Uh, I mean, it reads well, I hope, as well, but it certainly looks good. Uh, and I should also thank particularly, he's not here, unfortunately, today, but Tim Clark, who read the whole thing. I mean, it's amazing how few people read, you know, when you've written the book, it's amazing how few people ever have any evidence having read it, but Tim read the whole thing, I know he read the whole thing, because he sent me an annotated copy <laughs> with suggestions for changes, but even with Tim's BDI, um, there weren't that many errors, so I'm glad to say that although I've been able to correct a few things, principally it's exactly the same as the, as the uh, original hardback copy, but it's lighter. The original version was um, generously subsidized by the Japan Foundation, both in my initial period of study and writing in Japan, and then they also made a book grant towards the publication support. And when the first hardback edition was launched four years ago, that was held in the Japan Foundation offices that were then in Russell Square. So I'm um, delighted that Japan Foundation um, continues their, 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 their endeavors for us all. Uh, the paperback edition, though, was further sponsored with a grant from the Toshiba International Foundation. So another group to be thanked. Well, um, I've been asked to speak for about 45 minutes, and already 250 years in 300 pages is condensing things a lot. And condensing 300 pages into 45 minutes is going to be quite difficult too. So rather than doing that, I thought I'd just spend a couple of seconds telling you what the agenda behind the book is. And then I will give you an idea about you know, what I understand the Edo art to be, which then can be enlivened and expanded if you choose to read the book. Um, so the agenda is really that, of course, Japanese art is not the same as Western art. And although in a way that's certainly obvious, it's not quite as obvious as it might be. Because when people who know about Western art address a foreign culture, they start looking for the things subconsciously that they have in their own traditions. Uh, they might start looking like portraits, for example. If you come from Britain, particularly portraitures where art history was for much of it, or landscapes, for example. Or you might think about display. What do you hang in the bedroom and what do you hang in the dining room? Uh, and, and those kind of questions maybe would be meaningless to a Japanese viewer of the Edo period or an owner. They would start to say other questions. They would say, for example, what season should you hang a painting up? Uh, what clothing should you be wearing when you look at it? Should you look at it? And this is another thing I go into some detail about. The prohibition on viewing surrounding so many things is also something worth thinking about. Our historians talk about the viewer. What happens when you do it? But the money of times you can't view things. So those sort of questions, without fetishizing Japanese art as being different, suggesting that to go about understanding it, you need to think about other terms. Uh, and linked to that, what it therefore is not, is a history of sort of 1603 through to 1868, going through chronologically, saying, these are the important people, these are the important works, memorize them. I don't do that, partly because we find it very hard to memorize names and things from cultures we're not familiar with. I mean, I recently read the wonderful reaction book 
recent uh, publication on the art of early modern Korea, a subject I have great interest in, but I have no knowledge of Korea, and I instantly forget everyone's names. But what I did come away from that book with, because it was so well written, is concepts about understanding Korean art a little bit better. So that's what this is too. And to em demonstrate that on the cover image, which you see very small there, a totally unknown and in some senses insignificant painting. It's not a famous work of art. It's not by an artist anyone's ever heard of. People would say, why do you put that on the cover? But this is trying to tell you, this picture I'll come and talk about in a few minutes, encapsulates many things that, that makes Japanese art intriguing and a little bit different from um, the art of the European continent and its expanded areas. So that's the agenda. Now let me tell you something about um, the art of the Edo period as I understand it, and by all means ask questions or challenge things, uh, challenge points afterwards. So 1603 is the date at which historians mark the creation of the Edo period because it was that year that Tokugawa Ieyasu, a great warrior, became shogun. And he had the emperor nominate him to this uh, rank which had been defunct for a period. There had been shoguns in Japan before, but there weren't any. At that point, the lines had all died out. And he creates himself, has himself created as a new shogun. It wasn't obvious. There are many other things he could have become. He could have become a government minister. He could have married his daughter to the emperor. He could have done anything he wanted. But he decided to resurrect this title of shogun, which means being a military ruler. It means not being within the court in Kyoto. And many people in Kyoto entirely expected as soon as peace would come, the shogun would move and live in Kyoto. That's what they usually did. But he didn't. He went and built a city far away, right? two weeks' march away. Uh, I know it's two weeks because I walked Tokyo to Kyoto to see, and it's a great walk, and a two weeks' walk away, and a different sort of terrain, different sort of food is there, the weather's a bit different different expectations about culture. And so Japan suddenly bifurcates with an imperial a court in Kyoto and then this new shogunal regime in Edo. And of course, it takes a long time for the changes to emerge. It doesn't happen in 1603. But over time, um, <coughs> Edo becomes a, Edo Japan becomes a bi bipolar kind of area. Or I took the word of um, and a bicephalic. Right? It has two heads. Right? And those two heads, uh, to make some effort, are come jockeying, jockeying for power with each other and seeking to define each other. But before, uh, and, 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 and Iyasa probably chose this title of shogun because in the century before, there were continuous civil wars. Right? Japan is at civil war for about 130 years. It's almost impossible to conceive. Right? I mean, think of Iraq. It's bad enough in eight, or is it 12 years now? Right? That went on for um, 150 years. Right? All, everyone's sons were taken off to fight. Everyone's daughters were raped. Everyone was war widow, or it was just terrible. Everything was gone. You couldn't even walk through Kyoto. There wasn't a Kyoto. It had gone. Anything you see in Japan today can't be earlier than that, unless, of course, things in remote line, remote areas did survive, but the cities were gone. Uh, and so the shogun begins with a need to, to recreate, uh, to revive, to redefine, uh, and, of course, also to reinvent. And one painting, I think, um, very nicely summarizes this emergence from a period of civil war into a period of stability. And as we know, this period of stability lasted for 250 years because they had no idea it would last so long. They only came to power by killing the last lot. Perfectly easily, another lot would come along and kill them. It happened not to be that way. But this painting, which is, as you can see from the lines down, it is a screen. Screens virtually always come in pairs, so there should be another half but doesn't survive today. We have what's obviously the right-hand side, which means the first half. A left-hand side that would be the kind of sweet to it is not there anymore. We can't tell. But what you can see is protruding from the left is a dead branch. Right? A one wintry, desiccated leaf on it. And coming down into what must be a world of withered and, and wintry, hot, kind of cold and chill place, come down two mythical lions. Coming down on clouds. And they're called Chinese lions, it doesn't mean they're from China, they're mythical forms, and they have coats on fire. So they're not quite as great as the dragon, because the dragon doesn't live on the world. The dragon lives in the air and in the clouds and the seas. But Chinese lions live on this earth. They're mythical, they usually don't, but if they come to live, they live here. And these two are coming down out of the clouds to live in our world. 
And our world, if we can imagine from the lost screen, is a place of death and horror because it's been fighting for a century. But now, with their wonderful presence, peace has come back. And uh, I'm not quite sure to say this, but I'm pretty sure, I think, I'm hypothesizing, this one is a male, this one's a female. And it doesn't have a mane. So if you have a male and a female, of course, what, what you have is procreation, and therefore you have the future is guaranteed. All right? This is not just a momentary love and the peace. In the century of civil war, there had been momentary loves and peace, of course, but now we're saying, no, peace is back for good. And we'd like to know more about it, we don't know, but it seems like a painting like this would have been commissioned by a very senior warlord, perhaps even the Topogat family themselves, <laughs> as a statement. Right? We know it's been hard, we know the world's fall apart, there's been death and destruction, but now peace is back, believe in us. And the artist called Kano Eitoku was very well known for producing these very bombastic and quite um, immediate sorts of paintings. He did them pretty fast. Uh, not many people, they don't really reward a, a very long-term viewing, and they're not made even to be filmed, because if, if uh, the per most important person in the room, say me, if I'm, if I'm the great warlord and you're coming to you know, receive, give me homage or receive orders or something, then I'm sitting in front of it, so I can't see it. And I'm so important, your face is standing on the ground. You're not looking at the painting, you're certainly not looking at me. Right? So this is a case where a painting would not be seen, but would, a rapid, immediate impact would be given to the, to the viewer, and it would be you know, stunning to, to, to experience that. Well, Kanon Eitoku continues as uh, an artist just into the 16th century, 17th century, so he's alive when the Tokugawa are cementing their rule, but he then dies. And it's uh, his descendants who continue on um, in what becomes a hereditary school uh, painting for the shoguns. And I'll show you one of the slide later on case. This is now we have a pair of screens. Right? The right hand side should be on the right, the lower one should be on the left. And as you know, screens very wide that take up the whole again wall to show them properly. Somewhat similar, right? Immediate impact. Uh, they're fantastic paintings in a way, but you don't have to spend a lot of time looking at them to know what's going on. Now we have the dragon and the tiger, as I've um, labelled it. You may say, no, no, it's a tiger and a leopard. But no, because there's no tigers or leopards in Japan. They only had seen skins, and they believe that the leopard is the female of the tiger. So this painting is also telling you, male and female, it means procreation. It's here to stay. However, the dragon's on the right. Dragon comes first, because dragon is the only animal or being that can live in all the elements. Earth, air, wind, water, fire. It can move through anything. It is the lord of all creation. But dragons are very seldom seen. They don't really affect our world. They're something beyond. By contrast, the tiger is the lord of this world. We just saw the Chinese lions coming in. The Chinese lions also are mythical. They don't always appear. Tigers are always there somewhere. They may not have them in Japan, but they're, known. they're, real, they're real things. Right? So here we have the counterpoise between kind of cosmic regulation and order and human regulation and order, and it is within a dynastic structure. Right? They will produce cubs that will keep going. And the shogunate creating, in, 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 we don't know who actually goes this painting, but the group out of which this comes is saying, peace is back, uh, we are guaranteeing you peace, but of course, we intend to rule you for a long time. Right? The contract is we offer peace, in return, you offer submission. And the Camel School would continue to paint this kind of theme for the whole of the rest of the period. They, uh, they produced a, a secret treatise, which has never been translated into English in full, but a little portion of it have, I've translated bits of it, and they come with a slogan for what they do. The Camel School say, one brush, unchanged, for a thousand generations. We have painted what it means, what order and stability looks like. Why would you ever want to change that? Unless you want war again, keep filling your house with things like this, and peace will remain. Don't change your painting style unless you want to change the government. And the Camel School uh, continue painting uh, ever after in this way. Having said that, there are minor changes. We move on to a later Edo Camel School work. Now, we've still got the very brilliant gold screens, we've still got a kind of immediate impact painting, but now this is a series of the four seasons. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. 
and they become one of the most standard painting themes for warrior interiors. Over time, the depiction of actual force, albeit transposed into animals and, type and, and mythical forms, that becomes thought to be a little bit too brutal. And you get shown here the world in its peaceful cycle. Pages of the Four Seasons are kind of intriguing because at the one time they depict time, they depict how the world moves on. That's the, that is the sub, there's no other subject except, except time moves on. But at the same time, history, as we normally would call it, is deleted. Right? There is no movement from a past to a present. There's no time when the Shogunate was not there. There's no future when he won't be there either. We only have a circling within this beautiful, peaceful regime. Right? Time has now been stopped as something that humans do. Time is only something within nature. And it's a highly ideological painting made for a ruling elite to see themselves as having stilled this terrible fighting and to have quelled human activity. And now we have regulation, we have laws, we have discipline, and people are back being quiet again. Right? And uh, only, um, only nature moves. Well, for 200 years, maybe 250 years, people had this kind of painting in the house. I mean, rulers had this kind of painting in the house. And you can imagine they got heartily sick of it. Uh, the changes within the Camel School were minor, whereas the changes in actual society outside, of course, were major. Not only that, but there were changes in pigment, for example, fashions for different sorts of things. And the Camel School, being one brush unchanged for a thousand generations, they were completely precluded the possibility of metamorphosis and stuff. If they start painting a different way, they'll say, you're undermining the government. You're painting that way because the government should be that way. Right. So the Camel School gets stuck in this rhetoric of permanence, which made a lot of sense in 1600 when they begin. Makes very little sense in 1830, for example. Right. And one very intriguing painting today, this is in um, Krakow, and we saw it together, which if you remember, uh, we don't know how it got to Poland. It's a little painting, very small, minor work, not a big thing for display, but it's done by a camel school artist. Most of his time he's painting those big screens. And it's a servant girl. She is um, modestly dressed, but she's not a peasant or anything, probably a girl from a, um, in a, in a serving in a good household with a comb. And she's idly playing with a ball. All right. So it's a picture of a sort of a working girl at rest, but that ball is the artist's seal. Now, you would never fool around with an artist's seal. Artists keep their seals in beautiful um, brocade bags. And if you're a student, you would treat your artist's, your teacher's seal with the utmost respect. You probably wouldn't even touch it. Right? And the idea that you play with it, you're playing, he's playing with his artistic identity. Right? And on the woman's dress, also, it's his name. Right? Kano, right? Saw Seng, it's a... <laughs> I, now, the painting comes without any documentation, but it must mean something like, you know, here am I, he's one of the most famous artists of his age, he works for the show all the time, he paints important things, and he's saying, oh, but what am I doing? Right? I'm just churning out the same stuff. I've spent 25 years learning how to be exactly the same as my teacher, who had spent 25 years learning how to be exactly the same as his teacher. Right? Call this art. Right? I mean, they, uh, of course, didn't call it art, they called it other thing. We might call it propaganda, we might call it ideological painting, but it was one dimension, a case, of the visual world in which the elite lived. The depiction of the continuity of peace. And if you have young ladies and gentlemen brought up around paintings like this, not like this, like previous ones, then they should acquire virtuous behaviour. That would have been assumed to be true. Well, Making your young uh, sons and daughters virtuous is all very well, but of course art is also capable of doing other things. Art's capable of challenging, of questioning, of amusing. Camel School never challenged or interested or amused anyone. Right? <laughs> but painting could. And of course the Japanese tradition is deep enough that everyone realizes this is not all that art's about. And the Camel School themselves, in the treatise I mentioned, said painting comes in two kinds. There is painting which you learn how to do by study. And there's painting which you do because you have some brilliant mind. Both are good. But only painting which is taught can maintain the virtue of a regime. Because sometimes there aren't brilliant people around. 
But there's always going to be a need for throne rooms and castles filled with ideological paintings. So next let me come on to talk about the other side of things then. This painting you do because you're, you've got something to say. Right? Not because you've been studying it or you've been commissioned. You've got something to say. And I come back to the picture on the front of the book. Uh, it's not a well-known painting. It's not a famous thing at all. I've never even seen the original myself. But here we see a man who's dressed in the modern-day clothes of a member of the ruling elite, right? He's a samurai with two swords, and he's unrolled a painting. Somewhat implausibly, he's gone outside this house, and he's, un he's looking at his painting outside in the open air. And the painting doesn't seem to have much on it. There's a bit of a tree here, and you can't really see. And he's looking up to a bird, and what's happened? The bird has fled from the painting. Right? He painted a bird that had come to life. And this painting, in fact, does have a little more documentation about it because he mentions that he had dreamt at night that he painted a bird that was so filled with the life force of that bird that it came to life and flew off the page. Right? It's a completely different notion of what artistic creativity should be from what the Camel School were doing with those big... Um, political screens. Right? Now the hawk is a symbol of the samurai figure. So any person of samurai class has hawk paintings in their house. Why? Because hawks are trained killers. Right? They don't kill wantonly. They only kill if commanded to kill. And after the kill they return to their roost and they stay there. Right? So this is about a disciplined warrior group. But so disciplined no freedom, no self-expression, no ability for your own volition, and he sees himself, I want to be the hawk that came to life and went off and did its own thing. And he expresses that via the notion of what painting can do. And this is drawing, although this is very consciously contemporary for the period with the dress and with the hawk, he's referring back to one of the great ancient Chinese legends of superlative painting, which is not painting which is so good it makes your children virtuous, and makes the regime stable. It's painting which is so good that it brings life into things. And the story goes that an ancient Chinese painter called Zhang Senyo, who had lived in way, way back in classical times, who had painted a dragon that had flown off the page. And that, they said, was why he was a great artist. He wasn't a great artist because he painted for the king or he painted a throne room, or he did a court of justice. He was a great artist because he could actually even create life. And of course, the Western monotheisms have a problem with this because only God can create life. Mm -hmm. But in all these stages of thought, there's no reason why other generative forces can't exist. So there, in later Japanese painting, we see uh, an imagination of the actual creation of life. This is what art can do. And if you think that creating art life is terribly important, then in a way, the external appearance of the painting becomes rather less significant. Those dragons and tigers are beautiful gold screens. You may not want to look at them for hours, but the whole point is the external appearance. Who cares about the name of the artist? Who cares if the artist was a nice person or a bad person or how old they were or where they lived? It doesn't matter. But when you're saying, you are an amazing person and you have created life, then it's the you I'm interested in. So then suddenly it's the artist's biography, their thoughts, their personality, um, getting to know them perhaps, are things that people start to want to do. And as you start to want to know more and more and more about the artist, you might start to care less and less about the surface of the painting. So with <coughs> this kind of work, the creative, spontaneous, productive, non-ideological kind of painting, you get the notion that it comes out of somebody with a good heart, somebody who is a pure person. And what they produce may be so pure that not everyone can understand it. So you, in other words, you get a kind of conscious amateurism that is deliberately resistant to normal aesthetic interest. Right? I have painted life. You can't do it. And because I can do it, I do it in a way that you're likely not to be able to understand. And my painting will show you can't understand it by being a painter you don't like. But my friends like it, and the other people can create life, and so you get coteries of mutual appreciation, which are consciously exclusive what they're doing. To show you one example, uh, 
this painting, of course, people in this room are familiar with East Asian art, so you don't, but if I show this to people who've only ever seen, you know, Baroque churches before, they'd say, oh my God, you know, like, it's a mess. Of course, it's not a mess at all, it's very carefully done, but it's carefully done in a way to try to tell you that it's not about being realistic, right? It's not about showing anything specific. I mean, it's, there's no symbols here, there's no, it doesn't belong to anyone, it doesn't got beautiful colours on it. It's just using the brush to say something about myself. Right? And if you're somebody that understands that, if you're somebody of similar creativity and purity, you can understand it. But of course, those dollars out there can't. Right? Mm -hmm. And they paint these things on paper, therefore uh, not on silk. Silk is more expensive. They paint them just in monochrome, therefore all the expensive pigments are erased. Right? People who like pretty pictures don't understand these things. Right? And the generic term for such works are landscapes of the heart. Right? It's my heart that I'm painting. And Today we have a concept of abstract expressionism, but before that you have to paint something. So they find the landscape the best thing to paint. Landscapes are kind of eternal things, right? They are, um, usually it's nowhere, there's nowhere in Japan that looks like this, doesn't matter, it's my heart landscape. But because it's a landscape in which I lodge my heart, virtually always you get a little sort of evidence, not of a peasant who really lives in the countryside, but of some sort of gentleman's boudoir or arbor where they would sit there and view the world. So um, I said it's about painting of my heart. You may say, who cares what's in my heart? That's a very good question. Why should you care what's in my heart? The point is that these are educated elites. So what's in my heart is worth knowing about because I read history and I read poetry. Right? And if you read history and you read poetry too, your heart and my heart will actually be the same. It's not about my selfhood in our modern day sense of selfhood. It's about a shared um, take, right, on understanding of the human predicament, of life, of honor, of virtue, of all these things, which you get from reading the classics. And so that has always been the case. People have always read the classics throughout history. And so throughout history, in fact, there has been this mode of production, an amateur production, which shuns realism, which shuns um, avert interest in anything to do with commerce and, and buying and value. And the great figure who, as it were, you could never say an inventor, but the first, first figure who's really a famous name for having created this notion of the, the amateur whose paintings are worth doing because of the heart of the creator is a Chinese person called Ni Zhan. Right? And Ni Zhan is very interesting, and I'm not an expert on Chinese art, I won't go into it more, but clearly, you can see clearly, there's, been, there's a link between the two. The Japanese artist has wanted to emulate and refer to the previous artist. So you get the little hut, which has got two legs are too short, doesn't look like anyone could actually get into it. With a two, two border, you get the trees in the ground, and these ones. So it's, it's, it's clearly a reference. It's not a copy, of course not. He's painting his own hut. But because his own heart is like that heart of a great person from the past, as they would say, if I can get the whiskers of the ancients to grow on my own chin, which also is introduces a gender issue, which you might want to talk about and think about if we had more time, but never mind for now, uh, I'm assuming a male artist, that um, uh, 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 he's building in a kind of transhistorical community of educated people. We often call these people literati in English. Having said that, Nietzsche's paintings were extraordinarily rare and precious in China, so none of them could ever have come to Japan. Uh, he would have had to have seen a copy, or most likely a printed version, and when you compare the printed version with the Japanese one, actually they're much closer. Right. Um, so uh, these things are moving. Now the term literati is uh, used for these figures very much. The Japanese word is bunjin, which means the same. Bun means literature, jin means a person. And nicely the word jin, a person, does not have a gender dimension to it. And being about your selfhood, <coughs> Um, removed from social conventions, uh, not caring what other people think about you, into this world, actually, women were able to penetrate. If a woman had been able to read the books, which was not obvious because they're written in classical Chinese and many women don't have an education, but if a woman does, women can participate within these groupings too. And an in interesting figure 
is couple are Ike Taiga, who stands out today as one of the most famous Japanese practitioners of this consciously gentleman amateurish mode, who painted also with his wife. <coughs> so there was a man and woman who were doing painting it together, and this picture was done after their deaths, celebrating their, their, their achievements. And it's in a book called Kijin of Modern Times. I literally didn't translate the word Kijin. It means something like eccentrics or crazy people. People who don't follow the rules, right? Which is what these literati are doing. Right? They are distancing themselves from modern expectations and what, what sort of wallowing, willowing <coughs> in, in this notion of history. Um, and notice that Tiger, the man, um, he hasn't even bothered to shave. <coughs> His clothing is all hanging open. Well, maybe he didn't shave. But if you make a picture of somebody, you may, usually you make them look nice, right? So the artist has deliberately shown them as somebody who refuses to engage with social conventions, who's deliberately looking a bit wayward and strange. His wife is looking a little bit less wayward and strange, and no doubt this is also a gender dimension that you know, women have to be a little bit more under control um, in such societies. She's got proper clothing with her family crests on it. She's got no eyebrows, which means that she's married. Um, so, but in any case, they're making music together. This is a man and woman ha harmoniously existing together in a, in a marriage, but it's not about their marriage, it's about their painterly lives and their musical life and their engagement with um, the sort of trans transnational, transhistorical culture. And lest anyone feel too worried about this happening in, in Japan in, um, in 1790, a big round window on the wall outside shows that this is a reference to China. Uh, no such thing as a round window in Japanese architecture. It's a Chinese figure. So there we're shown, these people are a bit weird. Right? And we admire them for that, but it's not for everyone to do this. So the two extremes then, of on the one hand, the uh, camel school painting, where it's all about rigorous discipline, carefully rendered, expensive pigments, it makes clear point, no ambiguity about it, art as something that's learnt. And on the other side, we get here art because you've got something to say. And why have you got something to say? You've got something to say because you've studied a lot. And when you start studying things, you start challenging things. You, you don't believe what you see around you when you study. That's why we educate people, right? But of course, when you don't believe what is going around you, you start saying things the authorities don't like and you go to prison. So this is always done in the rhetoric of amateurishness, leisure time activities, being a bit wacky. I'm not trying to work for the government, they say. Right? Um, and in, within the authoritarian nature of the talking about Shogun regime, there's plenty of time for people to say rude things about the government, so long as they're very clear they're doing it as an amateurish leisure time activity. Don't try going down the streets with placards. So this was a way, an kind of outlet, an extreme way in which people could <coughs> express difference. Uh, different art historians take a different degree to the extent to which this is actually an attempt to make severe political judgments against the Shogunate. Is it just escapist, or is it, as far as they dare go, challenging the um, authority? If you start painting with your wife, or meeting people because you like each other, not because you're working together or because of your relations. These are things which are potentially very disturbing for the regime. Right? But if you say, we're only doing it, we're drunk, I'm terribly sorry, the much more we're going to work next day, then that's the terms in which this happens. And you do it in an area which you call China. <laughs> so that's two large areas in which the kind of visual world of the other um, of painting existed. But I want to talk about one more, and there's one more which I'm sure you know very much about, which is painting of the of modern life. I've talked about symbols, political symbols, I've talked about this sort of distance, historical notion. But Edo um, became the world's biggest city uh, within about a century. By 1750, it's you know, twice as big as London and has vast numbers of people in it. Kyoto also is a big city, Osaka is also a big city, and they have many wealthy people and people want stuff. And if you don't happen to be an elite person, you don't want paintings of dragons and tigers and gold screens, you feel really stupid having those in your house. And if you don't particularly like reading classical Chinese, then you're not going to do this kind of thing either. Most people, probably, most people in this room too, we want to have dinner with our friends, we want to like, wear the most recent clothes, we want to have a trip out somewhere nice occasionally, and that is where area three of depiction comes. So let me begin with one such work. 
Hanabusa Icho was originally a member of the Camel School. In other words, he was painting those dragons and tigers on gold screens. And although the historical record is very ambiguous and nobody really knows, what we know is what people say happened later on, which is that he had taken one of the shogun's cousins to a brothel. And they had a damn good time, apparently, and the next morning, of course, this had come to light. And he was accused, of course, of you know, leading a young man astray, or probably the point was not that he'd done it, but that it, it came to him. If they'd hidden it, it would be okay. But, um, and so he got exiled. Right? The Tokugawa regime didn't actually execute that many people. They did a lot of exile. And he was sent to this distant island, and eventually he was allowed back. And when he came back, of course, he couldn't rejoin the Camel School. His, his name was, you know, was worthless. But, but on the other hand, he'd seen something very interesting. He'd seen the regime from both sides. Right? He'd been an official artist. He'd hung out in a kind of low-life Caravaggio kind of thing in, 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 in place. Of, and that then became his thing. That became what he painted. When he came back from exile, he began to paint someone who painted the fissures and the cracks and the disjunctions within the modern world. Right? Within this world of power and authority and shoguns and dragons and tigers on one hand, and the escape into China on the other, something about where we're really living as normal people. You know, how do we think about it? How do we deal with it? Right? And he never did it in a very problematic way. He did it in a rather casual way. What he liked to paint above all were moments when suddenly people come together. So here, this is what he did several like this. It's a ferry, right? Many people would cross the ferries all the time. Edo was filled with waterways and very few bridges. So you come into a ferry, and suddenly you're surrounded by people that you, um, you didn't know them before, right? And you're waiting for, you probably talk to them. Where have you come from? What's your name? Maybe you fancy them and say, let's meet after sometime. Exchange two phone numbers if it was today. And um, little kind of encounters happen. Encounters which are not part of the normal strategic organized, stratified organization of society. You begin to make friends, you begin to see people not as family members or within hierarchies or within work situations, just people. It's, an, it's the anonymity of the city. And uh, Itcho virtually always goes to the problem, trouble of showing you an entire cross-section. So here's a samurai trying to bring his horse on, he's got his servants. There are old and young, there are men and women, there are clerical and lay. And for a little while, they'll brush sleeves. And then they'll move on. And we will never know what they said to each other, what they did with each other, what happened afterwards. It's that strangeness that happens within cities. It doesn't happen in villages. It's something that happens now. But to it sure is more intriguing than just depicting it. He always shows something that kind of contests that. For example, here, this person sitting right in the middle is dressed Halfway between, he's wearing outlandish clothes. He's got a Dutch hat, he's got a Portuguese sash, and he's got Korean trousers. And he's carrying a peat box. Right? A little child here, can you see, is looking into the peat box. We don't know what's inside it. But those peat boxes almost always showed either um, foreign views, view of Holland or view of you know, London or something, and people didn't travel much, or they showed rather erotic things. So it might, you know, what the butler saw kind of things through the peephole. Uh, and then on top of it all is a monkey, right? And the monkey's looking down because the monkey is, you know, the, the, in many cultures, it's the, it's the kind of the anti-human, it's the person that mocks human um, aspirations and conceits. Above it all, looking down, right? Looking down, this is the world, this is the human comedy. This is what Edo is. And uh, another one that, uh, uh, this existed, these all exist in many versions, and it clearly uh, Itchor was commissioned to keep making them. This is a good example of how a Japanese screen works, right? There's a zigzag, and there, non zigzag. The same thing. A, um, people have come together now not because of the ferry, but because of a shower of rain. It's not instantaneous. They will have to stay together for 10, 15 minutes until the rain stops. And they won't be in silence. They'll be talking to each other, they'll be exchanging things, they'll be talking about the different areas, where they go, what's a good restaurant to go to, what you need later on, and they stay there. And when the rain stops, they will disperse again. I can't tell exactly what this gate is, um, but uh, it must be a grand mansion of somebody. Right? So intriguingly, in this case, it is the mansion of the elite which is offering the space of this encounter. It's not as if, or equally, the government regulates the ferries. So the, the government is actually saying, <coughs> Itchor is saying, the government allows you these little spaces of encounter. Uh, it's 
It's not something which is overturning the state, but it's something which is integral. The government understands there are problems. And Itcho, in his own name, emblematizes this, because when he came back from exile, he couldn't any longer call himself Cam or something or other. He took the name Itcho, which means one butterfly. Right? And one butterfly can mean many things, but it always would refer to anyone would know me. We're talking about the dream of Zhuangzi. Right? So Zhuangzi, the sage of Taoism, right? when he was studying one day and he fell asleep and he dreamt he was a butterfly. And it was a really vivid dream. He was so sure he was a butterfly. And then when he woke up, he could never be sure he might, might not be now a butterfly asleep and dreaming he was a man. Right? So to refer to the dream of Zhuangzi is to refer to the basically the ambiguity of all situations. Right? We, we are, we're situational things. We might be one, we might be the other. Circumstances require things, and um, you know, there's, there's, there's no status to it. We can't be sure anything, what we are, what, we are, what it is. And so here, that, um, uh, that the, the, the zones in which we are unclear about things, which the dream says is everything, but anyways, here are shown as pockets within the city where little strange things happen, and we don't quite um, understand them. And just to uh, finish this one, can you see here, there's a <coughs> boy hanging upside down. It's the same as the monkey, right? This is an inversion. This is something which is a spinning world. It's not the way the dragons or tigers are there forever and eternity. It's not like Chinese classical culture which is there forever. This is Edo. This is what it is now. Well, Itcho um, painted the street in this way. Uh, but the, whilst the shogunate is happy enough for zones of encounter of this kind to take place, they're not really that happy about them happening on the street. And you've got the creation of sort of enclaves in which alternative perspectives and questionings and challenges, which at the same time are not regarded as revolution by government, they're kind of codified, can happen. And the term they gave to that, and you wanted the term, is the floating world. Although I prefer to say the floating worlds, of course Japanese has no singular or plural, but there was more than one, right? So the floating worlds are the spaces in which you can um, problematize and question the order in which you live, without the risk of being sent to prison for insulting the government. Right. And the floating world has two principal zones. One is the world of the kabuki theater. Of course, Japan has many theatrical forms, right? no and puppet theater and things. But the point about kabuki is it's, mo I mean, it's, it's always different. Mostly, it's about how you deal with living in the modern world. How do you deal with the fact that somebody else is richer than you, somebody else wants to, you know, somebody else won't marry you, you want them, and you, how can somebody else is more important, and these struggles for modern life. Right? So it's the Kabuki theater is one half of the floating world, and the other half is like a coin, which had two sides, the other half is the courtesan district. So the, I forgot to label this, sorry, but I'm only showing for you generically, the pictures of the theater district become really, really, really big. And Itchor's painting, after all, he was a famous artist, even though he'd gone into exile and had, you know, had problems with his life, but uh, his paintings would be very expensive. The actual theatre district, many people who are not rich go there. And the theatre's changing all times. So if you want a picture about the, a famous actor or what's on, what's on now, they're going to be things which are you know, basically ephemera. And so pictures of the floating world often are prints, cheap, anyone can have them. And this is just one. I'm just showing you a few gener generically. Uh, there's some event going on. Many times the plays have been lost, so we don't really know what's going on. But some big thug person is going to beat the head out of this person with an enormous rice cooker. Right? So something. It's, it's all sort of swashbuckling stuff. A lot of lot of lot of, lot of Kabuki plays, of course, are about um, you know how your father won't let you marry the person you want to. How do you deal with it? Your boss is so stupid, but he's upper class, and you're not. How do you deal with it? Right. This is what the Kabuki Theatre is about. And the Kabuki Theatre also is open to women. Right. So women can also go and find their own wish fulfillments and uh, compensatory imaginations right, in the theatre. And once you go to the theatre, of course, you're no longer with your relations or with your work people. You're just with other people. Right. And so the theatres are always dangerous places, encounters that are not policed and can't be judged. <coughs> And there are even kind of court ladies and the shogun's harem come, you know, under in disguise and such things. Many, many stories about such things. So that's one side of the coin. At any rate, the government accepted and policed and licensed the theatre district. It's fine, so long as it stays in its place. 
And the other was the courtesan district, and again, I'm showing you a very generic depiction. Utamaro, of course, very famous artist, rather, rather late. And again, it's a print, so it's, he's a very fine printmaker, so amongst the prints, it probably was expensive, but not that much. Students used to say, how much does it cost? And I used to say, it cost about the price of a CD. And now students say, what's a CD? <laughs> so, so, I mean, it was, you know, probably it's, it's like a pizza or something. You know? It's not a full meal. So, so anyone, there's hardly anyone is too poor to buy um, even one. And, but if you're really into it, you can buy one a day, and most people have a few. So anyway, it's showing the courtesans. You want to know how you spot a courtesan from a, a bourgeois woman. Courtesans close their sash at the front. And they don't wear socks, or that's not always obvious. Um, so these two areas, the floating worlds, which are called such, right? The floating world is not our modern world. It's the word they use at the time. It's the world which is not a fixed world. The fixed world is the world of honor and dignity and status and, and careers and propriety. But that is a world of stress. It's a hereditary system, after all. You're, you're not, it's not a meritocracy. You don't think you're where you should be. Either you're really worried because you, you know you're a fraud, or you're really worried, but you're really angry because you know you should be higher and you can't get that. Right? So the floating world is where you just get this off your chest and either go to the theatre and see plays enacted in which you imagine yourself not having these problems or resolving such problems, or you go to the courtesan district. And of course, the courtesan district is problematic in very, very many ways, and we have we come from a culture that has a lot of problems within that notion of paying for sex, but in the Edo period, they didn't have a problem with saying, claim sex. More the point, however, of the floating world district is that men and women could address each other. With, and the point is about a courtesan is she's nobody's daughter and nobody's wife. And that's the only woman you can speak to openly. Right. Otherwise, there's always going to be some issue, you know, like she's going to marry somebody later on, then what's going to come back? So, so um, the courtesan, whilst of course it's a commercial and totally exploitative relationship on the one hand, it's another period in which men go there and feel they're able to discourse in a way which is free. And also, when men go to such places, no doubt at the end of the evening, everyone you know, cops off with one woman each, but most of the evening, it's the men together talking. Right? So it's also a period in which conf conflict resolution can take place amongst men, or um, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of personal issues can be dealt with and, and, and worked through. Right? Uh, so, that's that. Now, I've come to the end of my time, and I just wanted to say just two little further images to show you. And if I can just recap, we're talking canal school, formal painting, government painting, shouldn't change. Then we've got literati style painting about the continuity of Chinese civilization, which often has ideals which you don't find in the modern world, about justice and virtue and morality, and you don't see them when you're on the street. But you sort of disappear into your imaginary world of antiquity and you just try, to, try to not think about it. Or you can pick, depict the theatre and the courtesan district the modern world uh, with its government-regulated zones of flotation outside the world. But there's one final figure who's a rather intriguing one, Harunobu. Now, Harunobu uh, it was the first printmaker, floating world printmaker, who printed in full colours. So he's the first person who makes prints which are basically as good as a painting. And uh, um, often the colours are faded, of course, but it would have been very, very striking and, and clear. And he began his multicolour printing in 1605, he died in 1670, so we have a five-year window for all these works by him, which also can tell you how much people produced, because there are hundreds of designs by Harold Noble. He was making them, I shouldn't say showing them out, because that's not the right metaphor, but he was producing them very, very much. And what are these two children doing? Right? It's their youths. A young man and a young woman. And they're walking somewhere in the snow under an umbrella. <clears throat> well, um, the, they're both nice bourgeois people. She, her robe is closed at the, at, at the back. She's obviously not a courtesan. She's not married because she's got long sleeves. He's the young married man. It, well, you know, it could be a nice boy taking his sister to a music lesson or something. But the floating world is always about imaginary with wish fulfillment and, and, and something different. There's always something a bit saucy going on with it. And so uh, I think that they're off for a bit of a twist, right? This is a pair of lovers. And um, some people who are my age and older will remember used to go to Japanese public toilets and there would be an umbrella drawn with the names down the other side, 
right? And this was, a, we would do like a hut, right? With an umbrella, with a light, with an arrow through it. You put your name on the side and you put the name of the person you want the arrow to go to on the other side, right? And in Japan, you do an app, you do an umbrella and do the name, because the name's written vertically. So being together under an umbrella is a very old method of being in love, right? Well, you have to get really close to somebody under an umbrella. Normally, you shouldn't. I mean, in Edo, you don't walk down, if you're a man, you don't walk down the street with a woman next to you. That's so humiliating. I mean, it's terrible, but it would be that way. So, so, so this is something very peculiar going on. And why are they wandering out in the snow? If it's snowing, you should be inside, probably. So my interpretation is they're going off to a double love suicide. No proof, but I think that's very likely, right? So what's being shown is this couple can't resolve the um, division between what social society requires and what their hearts and passions are telling them. And this is something which, if you've got a problem, go to the theatre or go to the courtesan district. And they're saying, no, we want to live in this world with the people that we love. No, that's not an option. Right, so you better go and disappear under a bridge somewhere and he'll slit her throat and then stab himself. Right? And there are many, many plays about this kind of thing. Right? It's terrible, of course, you think it's an awful story, but, but we all like tragedies, come on. It's not, it didn't happen all the time, but worry. Right? It's showing, in any case, what's, what's, what's going on, what's happening. So, sorry, that's what I've done. Lay down. Well, there were, I mean, love, love suicides, even, you know, I've done quite a lot of work with the Dutch East India Company records, and Dutch are great because they don't understand what's going on, so they write everything down. And they record many things which are not recorded in the Japanese sources. And they record urban myth because they don't know anything else, right? And they quite often talk about double, another double love suicide happened. The, government, the, the magistrates are really angry, and it shouldn't be allowed to happen, and parents have been told off. Um, but here, it's within the context of a floating world picture, which is about, which is about the problem of, um, uh, we, we don't like the world we're living in, then uh, it's sort of tolerated, as far as I know, Heaven or we've never had any problems with this, and of course, it's ambiguous enough that if the magistrate had said, I suspect this painting, this paint, pr picture is made for an improper purpose, you could, no, 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 they're just going for a walk in the snow. Uh, I'm going to leave the next slide for lack of time. The final one to show you, this is from that same series I just showed you, the generic courtesans. Uh, Utamaro, it's a series called 12 Hours from the Green Towers, or you might say Blue Towers, because it's the same word in East Asian languages. And 12 hours, because one of their hours is two of our hours, so 12 hours in the Blue Towers means <coughs> 24 hours in the courtesan district. And there's 12, 12 prints, different hours. But anyway, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. is kicking out time, right? So you've had the night there in the, in the, in the bordello, and Utamaro is famous for only ever painting extremely, depicting extremely beautiful women, but this woman's got one strand of hair hanging down in front of her face. This is as far as he ever went in showing somebody really exhausted and tousled and hasn't had a moment since her mess for night. And she's handing back the tunic to her customer. Right? It's morning, and she's got up, and this is the man's costume, and he's going to uh, wear it and go back into the morning uh, and go back to the city to, to start his job. Well, the robe is rather plain. Right? The man who's spent his time with a woman like this is going to be a very rich man. But likely he's not a man of high status. He's a wealthy merchant or something. So he can't be seen wearing expensive clothes around town. Well, that would be a big problem. So you wear plain clothes, then you have a really fancy lining. I deliberately want to see with a red lining. So, so um, a, a fancy lining, and in fact, you can't see it in this picture, but the lining is signed by an actually very famous artist who was a friend of Utamaro, so he's doing a plug for his friend here. Um, but it suggests, in any case, that the owner of this, of this jacket is a very wealthy but not high-status person, which is probably what most consumers of this image would like to imagine themselves to be. We, 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 no, we, no, not many of us fantasize about being, um, you know, aristocrats or top people, but we'd all like to be a bit richer, so this is the kind of thing, right? And um, uh, so that's what he's showing, really. But what's intriguing, of course, is what's on that lining, which is a depiction of Bodhidharma, right? Bodhidharma, the founder of Zen. Right? Bodhidharma, who was an Indian uh, man, and so he's shown with a big hairy beard, who had uh, come to China and then had crossed... You know, supposedly he crossed the rivers in China by floating on a reed, which is a miracle, and then his, his, his theories um, came eventually to Japan as, as Zen. But Zen is, you know, I'm not going to start to try to talk about Zen now, but, but, but you know, it's, it's basically about um, uh, 
it, it's, it's the impermanence and the vanity and the falsehood of this world. Right? And that if you spend your time trying to become richer and more important and get your children married to more important people and you know, get that dispute with the neighbors sorted out and all those things, that is vanity. That's what's vanity. Right? And what is more important is to think about in, impermanence and to basically this meditative state. Right? Well, Bodhidharma got that understanding of the vanities of the real world by removing himself from it. He sat for nine years in front of a rock cliff, and a rock face, and he lost the use of his arms and legs because they fell off. And he kept on falling asleep, so he ripped his eyelids off. It's a myth. Uh, for nine years. Well, and he, hadn't, and he didn't think about his parents. He never married. He never had any children. He, he removed it all with karmic links. Well, in this modern world, who has fewest karmic links of anyone? Not a monk, because all they care about is eating and becoming more important and becoming abbot of some famous place, or nuns. Well, the courtesan. A courtesan has no mother or father. She has no home. She has no children. She has no wife and her husband. She has no money. She has no possessions. Right? And a courtesan's contract is 10 years, whereas Bodhidharma only meditated for nine years in front of the rock face. So she, how perverse, how strange. Right? That figure of the floating world who you thought you were escaping from reality to have a nice, nice fun with. That is more real. That is more authoritative. Right? So the floating world then, strange enough, becomes reality. And this world we live in becomes what's fake. And this is why floating world art always had the potential to be very subversive. It's not because it makes pictures of courtesans, which was not a problem for them. Right? It's that it's fundamentally challenging the authority of the present. It's going beyond any of the other forms we've seen already. So, um, that's, sorry, I went on for longer than my allotted time, and I would love to speak to you for another hour, but um, that's sort of what I understand Edu to be, if I could put it so, you know, a bit pompously and do it in such a short time. I'd be very happy for any questions, if there is some uh, time for that as well. Thank you.